Um, I have been very fortunate in my career. Uh, I have been blessed with wonderful students and collaborators, both past and present. And I've been uh, blessed with inspirational and nurturing uh, mentors. And when Jan asked me to speak about two of those mentors, I was really very honored. So uh, Dr. Richard Wyatt was formerly my mentor. He's who I came to work uh, at the NIH with uh, long, long ago. And Dr. C. Marchetti, I, I came to uh, consider as a very important and formal mentor. So it's uh, my pleasure to tell you a bit about them. So let's talk about Richard Wyatt first. He, had, he got his MD at Hopkins, did a pediatrics internship at Case Western, and a psychiatry residency at Harvard. He came to uh, the NIH main campus as a yellow beret, and some of you may be too young to, to remember or to know that this was a mechanism by which people in the uh, late 60s and, and 70s who didn't want to get drafted and didn't want to go to Vietnam could come to the NIH and serve their country by en enlisting in the public health service. So that's uh, one of the mechanisms that uh, Richard uh, came for. He came uh, and worked with Julie Axelrod, among others, and uh, he was there for two years before he moved to an NIMH outpost that existed on the St. Elizabeth's campus uh, in the southeast. And this was really a paradise of neuroscience. People in the building who worked with Richard Floyd Bloom, Mimo Costa, uh, Sandro Guidotti, who some of you know, and in the 1970s, Richard became the director of the entire NIMH outpost there. And this was uh, the St. Elizabeth's Division of Intramural Research. This is a picture of uh, the William A. White Building at the St. Elizabeth's campus. This was an asylum in the very best sense of the word. Um, patients were a community, physicians were a community with patients, and this building, um, the way Richard envisioned it and put it together was also really very special. The patient wards were on one side, and uh, the laboratories studying rodents and uh, non-human primates were on the other. And Richard's uh, vision was that the basic scientists and the clinicians would be together in the same room constantly, or a lot. Uh, the, the basic scientists would come to patient rounds, we'd discuss the patients, um, and he uh, also believed that the clinical fellows should uh, develop a bench project. And so it happened when I first came there many, many years ago uh, that I found myself in St. Elizabeth's in the middle of Southeast uh, at night guillotining rats uh, as part of a sleep project that I was doing, uh, a pharmacology of sleep project that I was helping with at that time. Well, that didn't last very long because uh, I got very attracted and enamored to um, the new, really nascent uh, field of non-invasive uh, imaging of the function of the living, working human brain. So I, uh, I was lucky that Richard uh, a uh, enabled people to make uh, sort of mid-course changes and that he allowed us to uh, have access to the very best technology. So here's a picture of the Regional Cerebral Blood Flow Laboratory, circa 1983. Uh, this is John Morahisa, who was a fellow with me who went to be on to be uh, chair at Albany. And this is the Regional Cerebral Blood Flow uh, machine that we built basically from a box. People in Sweden had uh, uh, worked at this technology and uh, we contracted with them and worked with them and set up these 32 sodium iodide scintillation detectors that um, uh, documented the arrival and disappearance of xenon-133 gas which participants breathed uh, in order to measure regional cerebral blood flow.
As for Richard, he has a wide and varied research portfolio that was very inspiring to, uh, to us fellows. Um, he was the first to demonstrate very, the viability of fetal substantia nigral grafts to reverse experimental Parkinsonism in rodents. He did groundbreaking studies uh, on the neuropharmacology of sleep while he was uh, on the main campus. And you can see that these uh, papers were published in very high impact journals and made a big impression. He also studied sleep in schizophrenia and got extremely interested in schizophrenia. And sleep disturbances in schizophrenia remain of great scientific interest today. And this is a, a recurring theme. You'll see how prescient Richard was in the things that he studied. While he was uh, working with uh, Julie Axelrod, Dennis Murphy, and others, he developed a number of neurochemical assays that were novel, some, uh, and he used them to produce some of the very first biological correlates uh, of uh, having schizophrenia. And this was seen by many as a turning point in research in schizophrenia because it documented a biological uh, change with schizophrenia. Richard was also one of the first advocates for uh, archiving postmortem brain tissue so that neurochemical analyses could be done and uh, again published a very uh, noteworthy paper. And of course, this work is still going on. It was carried out by Joel Kleinman uh, after Richard and now by Barbara Lipska. In the last decades of Richard's life, much of his work focused on the potential benefits of early intervention in psychotic illness. And again, uh, a number of very important studies throughout the nation uh, the RAISE study, for example, has followed this lead and has tried to intervene early in the disorder. Richard also was one of the very first to be interested in maternal immunological uh, effects in schizophrenia. So again, very prescient. There are several, there's a, a Conti Center devoted to, uh, to studying this. So um, before Richard succumbed, to his third battle with cancer, this one was, was lung cancer. He um, uh, analyzed data, he wrote papers to the very end. He, uh, he wrote almost 800 papers and uh, six books in his 63 years uh, that he had with, uh, with the work. I've collected a few testimonials from uh, people who knew him well to give you a sense uh, of this man. Richard encouraged creativity and believed in learning by doing. He pushed for new ideas, challenged old ones, and gave his associates the opportunities to produce, to pursue their own curiosities. He created a fundamental esprit de corps and camaraderie, which I can personally attest to. He taught me uh, that clinical trials involved far more than dispensing an experimental drug under blinded conditions. He was kind, modest, and had deep concern for patients and for their families. He was a pioneer in recognizing the important responsibility of investigators to advocate for patients. And I, I uh, am very grateful to have uh, had him as my first mentor when I, uh, at NIMH. Let's talk about Seymour Ketty uh, a bit now. So Seymour got an MD at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and he did a rotating inter internship in Philadelphia as well. He never went on to advanced uh, psychiatry training. However, his work was some of the most fundamental in changing neuropsychiatric research. And some have said that he's been uh, the most influential person in the last half of uh, the last century. He uh, left clinical work and took an NRC postdoctoral fellowship at Mass General. And uh, he went back to UPenn, this was during wartime, and he got very interested in uh, cerebral circulation and trauma and hemorrhage. And he went to work with uh, Carl Schmidt, who was very famous in uh, mechanisms of cerebral circulation. And he worked on uh, regulatory mechanisms uh, of the circulation of the brain, and this is the first thing that Seymour got very famous for. 
He was recruited uh, to, in uh, 1950 to be the very first scientific director of the NIMH. And the way this was envisioned when it was first started was this was a combined program of NIMH and NINDB, the National Institute of Neurology, Neurological Disorders and Blindness. His leadership uh, was really remarkable during this period, not just his scientific leadership, but also uh, his people sense. He recruited a number of amazing individuals. Some 25 of the people that he hired were eventually elected to the National Academy, uh, where we are today, four won Lasker Awards, and two won Nobel Prizes. So this is really uh, a landmark of Dr. Keddie's. He is scientifically famous for at least two paradigm shifts. The first paradigm shift, paradigm shift number one, is his development of a reliable method for measuring cerebral blood flow. In doing so, he laid the foundation for modern functional brain imaging, uh, what many of us do today. This is an actual picture. This is figure two from uh, Dr. Ketty's landmark paper in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. This is how they measured blood flow in, uh, in those days. The participant is breathing nitrous oxide, uh, jugular, uh, there's a, a venous sampling through the jugular vein and arterial sampling through a catheter in the femoral artery. Dr. Ketty applied this to sleep, anesthesia, schizophrenia, mental arithmetic, LSD, and even LSD and schizophrenia. The IRB, if it existed back then, must have been very, very different. <laughs> but Seymour knew that um, what we really needed was a non-invasive technique and something that would allow us to uh, define regional activity in the brain in a much more fine-grained manner. So this is actually a, uh, a two figures from one of my very first data pa papers. I showed you the actual lab with 32 sodium iodide scintillation detectors, the participant in this case bring, breathing the inert gas xenon-133, and actually doing an activation task, the Wisconsin card sorting test. And this is the kind of data that we were restricted to in those days. This is a lateral view of the cortex, uh, blood flow measured with this method, and we can actually see front of the brain, back of the brain, frontal activation during this uh, executive task. Paradigm shift number two, and this had to do with genetics of schizophrenia. Dr. Ketty designed a very novel family uh, adoption methodology that provided the very first unequivocal evidence that schizophrenia had a genetic basis and that it was not a, a direct effect of uh, poor parenting. It was always uh, schizophrenogenic mothers, by the way, not schizo schizophrenogenic fathers, uh, but this is what most uh, psychiatrists were advocating at this time. So this was, this was a definite paradigm shift. He did this work in Denmark using a population-based uh, sample, uh, and this is the uh, landmark paper that he published about this. And as we all know, uh, genetic studies in schizophrenia and other neuropsychiatric disorders are paramount in our research portfolio today. This is an early picture of Dr. Ketty. He's in a boat near Copenhagen with one of his collaborators uh, in this uh, project, and I, I like this picture of him. Finally, after many years in 1999, Dr. Ketty won uh, the Lasker Award for Lifetime Achievement. Many people have wondered why it took so long for this to occur, and there is actually a story behind this, but that's a story for uh, another day. I'd like to just read uh, some of the, the uh, statements that were made when he got this award. It's often said that scientists succeed because they stand on the shoulders of their predecessors, who were giants in the field. It is fair to say that contemporary researchers whose work with PET scans and other imaging technology has revealed so much about the function of the human brain are standing on Ketty's shoulders. 
so too are those who study the genetics of mental illness. So this was uh, a long overdue and wonderful award uh, for Dr. Ketty. A few testimonials about him. He brought the methodological rigor of basic science and extraordinary insights into studies of the human brain. He launched neuroscience on its royal road to solving many of the mysteries of uh, psychopathological and neuropathological conditions. He was a giant among us, but his tread was soft, graceful, and unobtrusively dazzling. He never used his razor-sharp intellect to overwhelm or to intimidate. He always remained the same humble, modest, self-effacing, unselfish, considerate, kind, generous, and warm human being. He was intensely loyal and supportive of his colleagues, and he truly relished their successes whenever they occurred. I got to know uh, Dr. Ketty uh, around the work with blood flow. He consulted with us and was very, very helpful uh, to me personally. Uh, he's the one who suggested and encouraged me to do a second residency in nuclear medicine and to become double boarded in, in uh, psychiatry and nuclear medicine. Uh, he also headed the Ketty Committee, which uh, was a rather intimidating group of people, Dr. Ketty, Lou Sokolov, uh, Irv Kopin from NINDS, and young investigators who wanted to do a pet project had to go before this committee and uh, defend their proposal. I found it very helpful uh, and wonderful scientific discussions. I know that uh, both Dr. Wyatt and Dr. Ketty would be beyond thrilled to know that they are being memorialized by the awards that Dr. Amara is going to give out next. Uh, I can't think of a better way to um, uh, remember these wonderful mentors and remarkable human beings. Thank you. Our question, is dyslexia related to intelligence, yes or no? The answer is no. Many intelligent and extremely creative individuals have had dyslexia, including Thomas Edison, Albert Einstein, and probably Winston Churchill. What is important is that dyslexia is caught early. In my case, dyslexia wasn't really known when I was a child, and I had great difficulty reading, specifically when I was asked to read out loud. Today, where we know dyslexia exists and we know how to circumvent some of the problems, it's important that any parent who feels their child is having a reading difficulty seek the advice of their pediatrician and educational specialists who are present in many school systems.